Okay, our second speaker is our old friend Rosario, Giuseppe Rosario Mingioni from University of Parma and probably Katnina at all. Please, Rosario. Okay, so thanks a lot for this invitation. I'm very pleased and honored to be here and to see the old St. Petersburg friends. Okay, before I start, let me give a brief prelude to my presentation, also because I want to, to say my, my links to this uh, uh, fantastic St. Petersburg School of Mathematics. And um, uh, um, uh, this picture, I think you already showed in the past, this refers to a long visit I had in St. Petersburg in 2001, when I, where I also met Olga Lavishenskaya, but I also met other people. For instance, this is a picture taken at Nina Ryatseva's place, and this is the great Russian mathematician Grigory Seryegin. And um, uh, with Nina, we met several times. In fact, here we are in New Seoul at the Institute Mita Gleffler, and we met, be we met before. And uh, we have seen uh, several times, for instance, this is in Bed Labor in 2006, and uh, this is a uh, in Cambridge in 2014, I, I, I mean, I just had a bit the colors to make the picture more, more interesting. And uh, um, so I'm very, I'm very, I'm very, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about the mathematics in St. Petersburg. And in fact, I like very much also this uh, St. Petersburg math journal that contains a lot of gems and a lot of masterpieces uh, uh, along uh, many decades, uh, especially in the theory of elliptic and parabolic equations and in regularity theory that I'm especially interested in. So I, I, I recommend to send uh, very good papers to this journal. And I, 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 di I, I, did, I did by myself, these are, these are two, two papers I, I, I published on this, on this journal. In fact, the, the first is dedicated to, to Nina Ualceva. And um, th there's also another reason I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very um, um, honored to be here because St. Petersburg is the place where the Pilaplacian theory started. So the Pilaplacian operator, which is the following one, which is the one you're looking at, uh, is essentially an old women's story because essentially the regularity theory of this operator is an old women's story that started with a very fundamental and pioneering paper by Nina Realtsev in 67. You can see on the left, uh, this is a translation that Nina had done, uh, I think in 2000, and this is also a dedication to me there. And this was in 67, and um, uh, many years later, the vectorial version was achieved by Karen Nuremberg. Uh, and this is by far the best paper of Karen Uhlenbeck. This is not my opinion, in fact. Uh, uh, this is, in fact, uh, uh, her own opinion. And can you imagine that, uh, uh, that the best paper of an Nobel Prize recipient is essentially the extension of Nina's result uh, to the vectorial version? So I'm, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about all these mathematics that have been done, that has been done there. And uh, so therefore, as a last homage, I, I, I named my cat Nina, and that you are looking at, uh, you are looking at here, and she's also a mathematician working in PDs. Uh, okay, let me start with the official presentation. Okay, notions of non-uniform ellipticity. This is a topic that has been studied in St. Petersburg a lot, and I'm happy to present these results here. So I'm mainly uh, concerned about uh, minimizers of, uh, or, uh, of, uh, of integral functionals of the calculus of variations and also elliptic equations in divergence form. And of course, the catch is given by the Euler-Lagrange equation. The catch is given by the Euler-Lagrange equation. And uh, um, as far as a priori estimates are concerned, um, we, uh, we do ev almost everything for, for um, also uh, for equations. Okay, what do we mean by ellipticity? We take the first derivative of the vector field A, which is a matrix, of course, and we say that we have a control with two non-negative functions, G1 and G2, also depending on X, uh, of the least and the largest eigenvalues. So G1 and G2 are measures of the least and the, la and the, high and the largest eigenvalues. And uh, in the case of functionals, this uh, amounts to say that the second variations uh, is about, uh, is, uh, is constrained by G1 and G2. And in the autonomous case, just to be general, I take G1 and G2 
both depending on X and on, uh, on Z. And in the autonomous case, you have no X dependence. So G1 and G2 can be whatever. Um, okay, uniform ellipticity means, uh, okay, there are many, many definitions of uniform ellipticity. The one I would like to stress here is that I'm, I'm interested that when the values of the, of, the, of the gradient are rather large. So when this ratio keeps bounded, then we are in presence of uniform ellipticity and this for large values of Z. And uh, when, uh, a, when the partial derivative of uh, A are symmetric, then this is essentially the same to prescribe that the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue is controlled. Why this is important? Because this is the quantity that uh, comes up whenever, whatever you do when you do elliptic and parabolic estimates. So when this condition is not satisfied, then you will see, you will, you'll be in presence of non-uniform ellipticity. This is the definition I adopt here. And it's very, very important to make a distinction when there is X, so you have non-autonomous functionals and problems, and when there is no X, because as we shall see, the presence of X in, the, in combination with non-uniform ellipticity or no standard growth conditions, then uh, creates very, very uh, many differences. And um, uh, just keep in mind that this condition has nothing to do with the fact of being non-degenerate. So you can be degenerate and uniformly elliptic. And this is the, the instance of the Pila-Plasian operator. The Pila-Plasian operator is uniformly elliptic, but is degenerate. Uh, but uh, the fact that you can control the, rate, the, the highest and the lowest eigenvalue with the same quantity, which is z to the p minus two, really implies the whole regularity theory. So you can work with the Pila-Plasian from the regularity theory viewpoint because it is uniformly elliptic, no matter it is degenerate. Um, and, um, and you can also make perturbations and, um, um, uh, and you can also make perturbations. And um, uh, this is a classical tool, non-uniform ellipticity is a very, very classical tool. And uh, non-uniform ellipticity means that there exists at least one point when there is an X dependence, uh, such that when Z goes to plus infinity, this becomes unbounded. So this is essentially the notion of, non of pointwise non-uniform ellipticity. So you just pick one point and this is not bounded anymore. But we shall expand uh, on this more. Of course, you can give the same definitions in, for non-divergence form equations. And uh, I'm not expanding on this because I'm not going to talk about this. But essentially, it's the same principle. Whenever the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue remains bounded, then it's uniformly elliptic. Otherwise, it is not. Um, and this is essentially the very basic, the very basic thing. So this is a classical topic that has been especially studied in St. Petersburg. And uh, there are wonderful papers of Lagishenska and Duralceva, especially there's a, a, a very important paper on CPAM in 1970. But it has been studied also before by people like Gilbert. And actually, the minimal surface operator is a classical example of uh, non uniformly elliptic operator. People like Finn, Gilbert, also Stampakia, Hartmann, and Stampakia. And especially, this, there are many masterpieces by uh, Russian authors like Ivochkin, Oskolkov, and Oskolkov, of course. There are uh, these uh, uh, important papers by Selling, um, Tudinger's thesis. And in particular, I would like to stress a book, uh, okay, the work by Ivanov. Ivanov made work on non-uniformly elliptic problems uh, uh, since the end of the 60s and uh, towards the whole 70s. And I'm going to come back on this later on. And then there are important papers by Leon Simon. These are, uh, let's say, the, the, the early and old contributions on non-uniform ellipticity. Uh, more recent ones are by Trudinger, by Zhikov especially, and, I'm, and also I'm coming back on Zhikov's work in a few, in a few moments. Uh, there are wonderful papers on non-uniformly elliptic variational functionals by Zhikov in the 80s and in the 90s. There's a pioneering paper by Yuri Altsev and Udaletova on anisotropic uh, functionals. This is a paper that has not been uh, known very much in the West. Uh, and in fact, I received it from, uh, by, by the real, by the very hands of Nino Altsev in, in 2001 in St. Petersburg. And then there are, uh, there's, a, there's an important monograph by Ivanov uh, who summarizes all the results made until the end, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the 80s. And then there are these classical papers by Marcellini, 
in the context of calculus of variations. Uh, these are a few examples. This is the, 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 the very important paper by Lagishevsky and Duell also from 1970. These are two papers. Uh, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, where also a, a vast generalization of minimal surfaces operators are given and treated. Uh, these are two papers that are classics by uh, Neil Trudinger. And uh, this is a, a paper by Leon Simon, where he further extends these approaches by this uh, paper by Lagishevsky and Duyalza, and it's an also very important paper. These are very, very delicate papers. Of course, um, there, are many, there, there is much more. Uh, okay, now let me, uh, let me go back on the definitions, because uh, here I would like to stress on a few differences we have to point out uh, when we have non-autonomous problems. Non-autonomous variational problems means uh, that uh, the integrand explicitly depends on x. Now, the point I would like immediately to stress is that while in the uniformly elliptic case, x uh, works, uh, the presence of coefficients works as a perturbation, this is not the case under in, in the setting of non-uniform ellipticity. In fact, the new phenomenon is that certain problems become uniformly uh, elliptic when there are no coefficients, but when you add coefficients, it's the real presence of coefficients to make them non-uniformly elliptic in a certain sense. And this means that uh, the presence of coefficients cannot be dealt with as a perturbation. So as I told you, the classical non-uniform ellipticity is as follows. You find one X for which the ratio between the highest and the lowest second value goes to plus infinity when the gradient becomes large. This is the classical definition. Um, uh, this is called the ellipticity ratio. So this quantity is called the pointwise ellipticity ratio, the classical ellipticity ratio. Uh, now, uh, the, the, main, the main common point of the whole literature on non-uniformly elliptic problems is that uh, uh, there is one single assumption that rules essentially everything is that uh, we want to bound the rate with which um, um, uh, uh, with which this quantity goes to plus infinity when the gradient becomes large. Why? Because on one hand, you want to prove that, uh, 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 that the gradient stays bounded. In order to prove that the gradient stays bounded, you need that this quantity is not too large. On the other hand, this quantity gets large when the gradient gets larger. And then, uh, and then there is a competition between the two. So you solve this competition by prescribing that the ratio grows as a small power of the gradient. So that's the main assumption that you, 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 are, uh, you are dealing with in the whole literature. So in a way or in another, this is the main assumption you're working with. And um, uh, specifically, another typical assumption is that uh, you prescribe in the, in the, in the framework of the pila Laplacian operator, you prescribe uh, that, um, uh, that the, the ratio, that the lowest second value grows with a power which is different from the largest one. So you have P and Q and Q is larger or equal than P. And then this ratio grows as Z to the Q minus P. So you need that Q is not too far apart from P. And these are usually called in the, in the Marcellini's terminology with an author that dealt uh, in pioneering papers with the non-uniformly elliptic problems in the setting of the calculus of variations with the PQ growth conditions. These conditions are the scaled one that you find in certain, uh, in certain examples from nonlinear elasticity where you have an integrand that whose coercivity has an exponent which is strictly lower than uh, the control exponent on the, uh, in the upper bound. Okay, a basic condition is that uh, the ratio between Q and P cannot be too far apart from one. This means that Q minus P cannot be too large. This is essentially the assumption that uh, I showed you before. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a typical condition that you get in order to prove regularity and Lipschitz continuity of minimizers in the autonomous case. And the condition that generates with the dimension. Um, 
there are many people working on this on these kinds of problems. For instance, even recently, there are some interesting papers by Bell and Schefter and Schefter and Hirsch and Schefter where they find more and more bounds. And then there's a, a, an interesting paper by De Filippi, Christensen, and Koch uh, that is still in preparation. Uh, the best bound is not known, but the asymptotic uh, is always uh, O_n or one over n or something like that. Okay. Now, let me go back on the definition of the ellipticity ratio. In the case uh, of, uh, 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 of non-autonomous functionals, we need to introduce two kinds of ellipticity ratios. The first one is the classical one that is given in the following pointwise sense. You freeze x zero, and you just consider the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue, of, uh, of, the, of, of the second derivatives of f. This is the pointwise ellipticity ratio. Next to the pointwise ellipticity ratio, uh, I would like to consider this larger quantity that I call non-local ellipticity ratio. So this is defined as follows, and it's a non-local quantity because you fix a ball and you, you make a different ratio. So you take the soup of all the highest possible eigenvalue when x varies in the ball over the inf when x varies in the ball. Of course, these two quantities are completely equal where there is, when there is no dependence on x of the integrand f. Otherwise, the non-local ellipticity quantity, the non-local ellipticity ratio uh, dominates the pointwise classical one. Um, uh, so why do we need this second larger quantity? Because it detects milder form milder forms of, uh, of non-uniform ellipticity. So let me, let me, that are really linked to special, special uh, 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 occurrences in, in the calculus of variations and in, and in, uh, and in elliptic equations. Um, we, so we shall say that the integral is non-uniformly elliptic if the pointwise ratio goes to plus infinity. If this stays bounded, but the non-local ellipticity ratio goes to plus infinity, we shall call it softly non-uniformly elliptic. So it's a milder form of non-uniform ellipticity. And so we finally call it uniformly elliptic if the ellipticity in the non-local ellipticity ratio stays bounded. So uh, uh, this difference uh, occurs only in the case of non-autonomous functionals. And, uh, and, um, and so we have two intermediate notions of non-uniform ellipticity. So for further discussion, please see a recent paper by Cristiana De Filippis and myself and a, and a previous paper by Elisa Beck and myself. Okay, um, let me give an example that tells you why this, uh, uh, this uh, difference, this presence of two uh, different definitions is necessary. Uh, so Vladimir Zhikov, uh, uh, Vasily, sorry, Vasily Zhikov, uh, was uh, 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 was really a remarkable mathematician working in, in Russia. I met him several times. He was a friend of mine, and I, I always uh, um, uh, I always admired his work. So he introduced several. Uh, 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 so he wrote several papers on the on the occurrence of the uh, of the Lagrangian phenomenon and the nonlinear elasticity, and introduced in particular this function of the this functional that became very popular in the last years, and it's called the double phase functional. So you have a mixture of uh, two p Laplacians, a p Laplacian and a q Laplacian. Q is larger than p. And a of x is larger than zero to preserve ellipticity, but can be zero. So you have a sort of phase transition at those points, at those points x, where a of x is larger than zero, the dominating part is dv to the q, otherwise it's dv to the p. So you shift between two different, uh, two different exponents, and this uh, gives a shift between two different uh, materials when you consider, for instance, a composite. Okay, what happens with this functional? It happens the following. If you look at the pointwise ellipticity ratio, then this is perfectly uniformly elliptic. So this is uniformly a uniformly elliptic functional. Its Euler-Lagrange equation is perfectly uniformly elliptic in the classical sense, and no question about that. On the other hand, 
if you look at the non-local ellipticity ratio and you take a ball that meets a of x and you assume that a of x uh, for instance is bounded then the ratio then the ellipticity ratio goes like this so it blows up when the gradient goes to plus infinity so this is a uh, um, a, a softly non-uniformly elliptic. So it's intermediate. It's pointwise uniformly elliptic, but it's softly non-uniformly elliptic. So why it is important that this is not considered to be classically uniformly elliptic? Because in the for non-uniformly for uniformly elliptic problems, you expect that the classical results for for uniformly elliptic problems hold, like for instance, Schauder theory. And now the surprise comes with this example that we uh, that we obtained working on previous Zhikov examples um, uh, that tells the following. Uh, you have a, a perfectly uniform, pointwise uniformly elliptic functional with a Hilder continuous coefficient, Hilder continuous. So you would expect that the gradient, and you make it, you can make it also non-degenerate. So you would expect that the gradient is Hilder continuous in the realm of traditional Schauder estimates. So if this would be considered classically uniformly elliptic, then you would expect that the gradient is, uh, is regular uh, because coefficients are held continuous, but this is not the case. If you take P and Q far apart enough, depending on alpha, then you get a minimizer with set of essential discontinuity points has out of dimension almost as maximal. And uh, this is certainly doesn't belong to the realm of uh, no uniform elliptic problems. So it is necessary to make a distinction uh, because there are these intermediate phenomena that happens uh, that happen already in the case of classically uniformly elliptic functions. On the other end, here, in order to build a counterexample that was eventually also uh, other counterexamples in the same line that been uh, uh, studied by Balchi, Dining, and Surnachov in, in, in a series of very interesting papers, I think that Surnachov talk was about this, the, these kinds of, of, of examples. And uh, uh, on the other end, if, you, if, Q, if Q and P are not too far apart from each other, then you can prove that uh, that the gradient has the regularity expected that it, that is the same one of the p Laplacian operator. So if q over p is not too far apart from one, plus this quantity that depends both on the rate of continuity of co of the coefficients and on the dimension, then du is locally under continuous. So this example is telling two things: that there's a subtle interaction between the rate of elder continuity and the growth of the functional. And this is not, this is a new phenomenon with respect to the classical one of non-uniformly elliptic problems. And then there is an interplay uh, 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 between, and then the, it, it also tells you the following, that if A is constant, then this is perfectly uniformly elliptic. So it's the real presence of the, of the coefficient to make this problem non-uniformly elliptic. And so, not surprisingly, you get counterexamples like this, because it's the real presence of, uh, uh, of, of the coefficient x to make this problem non-uniformly elliptic. Uh, so this means that, uh, that already in this milder, milder, non-uniformly elliptic situation, there are problems. And for instance, Schauder estimates do not always work because here you have Hilder continuous coefficients and discontinuous solutions. Okay, so there is by now a large literature on this softly uniform, non-uniformly elliptic functions. So these are the, uh, those functions where that are pointwise uniformly elliptic, but uh, whose no local ellipticity ratio goes to plus infinity. So these are not the traditional ones. These are these intermediate softer functionals. And you can still use the fact that they are pointwise uniformly elliptic to prove regularity of minimizers and solutions. 
This has been done in several examples, starting from a few papers by Yashabi and myself. Then this is a, a series of recent papers. And then there are two very interesting papers by Hastra and Oak on gems and arm uh, that, uh, uh, um, that consider in a sense the, the, the largest possible, the most general possible situation of softly, non-uniformly elliptic functions. Okay, this was to tell you that already in this milder, non-uniformly uh, non elliptic situation, things uh, can be very difficult. On the other hand, today I would like to talk about the hard, uh, let's say the, the classical non-uniformly elliptic problems. In the sense that even under, uh, I would like to consider model problems of the following type. You, you take a non-uniformly elliptic pointwise energy. So the ratio stays fixed between like Q and P and you make just a coefficient, the simplest possible case. And I would like to deal with the Schauder theory in this case. So you see that even if you add a coefficient, since the perturbation affects the whole energy, then there's no difference. And there's uh, uh, the, the functional remains hardly pointwise non-uniform uh, non-uniformly elliptic. And I would like to talk about shadow estimates for these kinds of problems that have not been treated in the literature by now. So let me give a brief recall of shadow theory. Okay, Schauder theory is very well known to experts and especially in St. Petersburg. Uh, let me uh, tell uh, uh, a few things about Schauder theory. Uh, solutions to the, to, the, to the Poisson equation, to the, to the Laplace equations are smooth. And uh, the question is what happens when you add coefficients? What happens when you add coefficients? Uh, the idea is that since coefficients stick to the solutions, then they, they have room enough to destroy the regularity of solutions if they are not regular. And then you, of course, you, you, you assume that coefficients are elliptic, otherwise uh, uh, there's no, no, no meaning in doing that. But so you would expect that solutions are no more regular than coefficients, that what coefficients are. And this is actually the case. This is a classical result in the linear case. It has been obtained by several authors and the first form of, uh, of, um, of uh, um, Schauder theory in the interior was obtained in 29 by Hopf and then up to the boundary with the sharp exponent, uh, first by Gacciopoli and then by Schauder. And um, they, they are a very basic classical tool in uh, theory of elliptic and parabolic PDEs. I don't really have to explain what shadow uh, estimates are for. This is a very basic, basic tool. And today there are very, uh, very modern proofs because the first proofs were relying also on potential theory. Nowadays you have modern proofs gives by perturbations uh, by Campanato, by Tudinger via convolutions, by Leon Simon via blow up. But all these proofs, they are uh, requiring two things. Okay, the method of the proof is essentially always the same. You freeze coefficients in a way or in another because blow up is an asymptotic freezing in a sense. And then you compare your original solutions with solutions to frozen problems. Solutions to frozen problems are okay. And then your solutions are okay. Uh, this can be done if all estimates involved are homogeneous, because, uh, because then you have to make iterations and making iterations with non-homogeneous quantities, it's a difficult story in regularity. Regularity is essentially iterations of homogeneous estimates. For instance, this is a very classical approach of Campanato that describes what I was telling you before. You take your equation with the uh, variable coefficients, you freeze coefficients at one point, you solve the problem. So B is the solution of this frozen problem. So it's up to a change of variable and harmonic function. And then you first describe, you first uh, uh, encode the Lipschitz and the regularity properties of the uh, frozen problem solution in this estimate that tells you essentially that DB in the language of Campanato spaces is, uh, is Lipschitz. And then you prove a comparison estimates. Then using the fact that both estimates are homogeneous of degree two, then you can combine and iterate in order to get to catch the final uh, Hilder estimate for the group. Uh, this is a general scheme that can be done also for the P Laplacian operator. This was done first by Manfredi. 
uh, and in the case p equal to two by Jacquin and Giusti before. And essentially, uh, the idea is that uh, you go into Uralza Raulenbeck theory, uh, you manipulate the regularity estimates, you find the analog of this Campagnato decay estimates for frozen solutions, and then you make a comparison. The, the outcome is always the same up to the fact that you don't have the sharp exponents, because as shown by Uralza and her students by mean uh, of counterexamples, in the Pilaplacian operator, due to the degeneracy, you don't get that the U is elder continuous with every exponent, but you still get that the gradient is elder continuous. Uh, this is the, 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 the thesis of Manfredi, uh, which is a smooth introduction to basic Pilaplacian regularity theory. And uh, I recommend young people to look at it. And this is essentially what I told you before. You, 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 you freeze the problem, then for the frozen problem, you have good estimates, and then you can make a comparison. And after this, you can do you can do the whole the, the, the real thing. Uh, now, what happens to uh, another classical fact in the theory of the calculus of variations happens when you when you are dealing with so-called non-differentiable functions. So the classical approach until the, the end of the seventies, the calculus of variations and its regularity problems was that you take a functional, you consider the euler Lagrange equation. And then you work with the euler Lagrange equation. On the other hand, the question is what happens when, the, for instance, you have a lower order perturbation like this, which is non differentiable with respect to B. So there's no euler Lagrange equation because you cannot really write it. You can write it. And so there's a classical approach by Jacquin and Jusin, by many authors uh, after. Uh, that relies essentially on minimality to prove regularity of minimizers. This is this famous uh, paper by Jaguint and Giusti from 1883, and it was simultaneously also obtained by Ebert. And uh, the idea is that you can still do this, and you can still do this even if you have a, a perturbation of, uh, of this type. So you see, we are now outside the realm of classical shadow theory because you have a dependence uh, on coefficients on the solution itself. On the other hand, it's still, it's still in the spirit of Schauder theory because you want to prove that solutions are regular when um, coefficients uh, are there. Okay, now let me summarize. There are two classical facts. Solutions, uh, Schauder estimates for uniformly elliptic problems. And this is a view to these authors and uh, for minimizers of non-differentiable functions. Now, the point is that these two basic facts are open in the non-uniformly elliptic case. So Schauder theory in the non-uniformly elliptic case has always been an open problem treated only under very, very special structure assumptions. So this is the open problem. Just le let's take a non-uniformly operator. So therefore, it's pointwise non-uniformly elliptic. So the pointwise ellipticity ratio goes to plus infinity. Let's add coefficients. It is not known that it was, it is not known that the gradient is elder continuous. And the second problem is that take a non-uniformly elliptic integrand this time at the lower order perturbation that makes it non-differentiable, makes the functional non-differentiable and prove that U is elder continuous. This is still an open problem. And uh, let, me, uh, let me tell you about the appearance of these open problems in the literature. Uh, for instance, this is the review of Gary Lieberman of this classical Jacquin and Justy paper where he comments that uh, that the, in fact, uh, when these growth properties, growth properties means no uniform ellipticity fail, then uh, either you assume that the gradient is bounded, but then there is no problem anymore because the problem uh, gets back to the realm of a uniform ellipticity or otherwise these results do not apply. So the results of this paper are much more striking when applied to uniformly elliptic equations, essentially because they don't apply to non uniformly elliptic problems. Uh, this is a beautiful monograph by Ivanov. Uh, this collects a lot of thoughts made towards non-uniformly elliptic problems in St. Petersburg. And I would also recommend that people from the West look at it. 
And also Ivanov notes that if you want to apply the results of Lagicheska and Duralsera, the classical Lagicheska and Duralsera proof, you, you, should, uh, you should get an a priori estimate on the gradient. So either you get an a priori estimate on the, on the gradient and you assume that it's bounded or you prove it, which is not known under, under special, uh, under Hilder continuous coefficients. And in fact, uh, this is a classical theorem of the uh, Lagicheska Realsera as reported from Ivanov's book. And you see that first you have to consider that the gradient is bounded and then all differentiability properties are satisfied with respect to coefficients. And then you can prove that the gradient is Hilder continuous. But you have to assume these two things. And essentially, the fact that the gradient is bounded rules out non uniform ellipticity because non uniform ellipticity only takes uh, place at infinity when the gradient is large. And uh, this is also another appearance of this, of this issue. This is directly from a paper by Jacquin and Giusti, where they again observe that. Uh, if, for instance, they would like to apply their results to non uniformly elliptic operators like minimal surface operators and so forth, they need a gradient bound. Otherwise, nothing to do. So the problem has remained open. And uh, uh, as I told you, only this case of mild non uniform ellipticity has been treated, but the real classical one has, has remained untouched. And today I would like to briefly present the solutions to, the, to both the problems that appear in a recent paper by Cristiana De Filippis, who is also from Parma, and myself. Uh, it was crucial, the appearance of Cristiana in this, uh, for the solution of, the, of these problems. Uh, and, um, um, and the crucial point is, of course, to get L infinity bounds, as also specified by Ivanov in his book and in, in the literature, because after this, you can re-manipulate with a certain care uh, the classical perturbation approaches. So the first problem deals with non-uniformly uh, uh, with the non-differentiable functionals. So we get uh, a truly non-uniformly elliptic integrand, a lower order perturbation, which is even allowed to be measurable with respect to X because it's lower order, but only elder continuous. So this is the model considered by Jaguint and Giusti. And then we get that under this bound, the, the blue one is just a constant. May it, it can be improved a bit, but it's just essentially a, a constant that never vanishes. But under the same bound of the double phase functional, under the same asymptotic, then we prove that u is locally under continuous. And this, this is the first result at all on these kinds of problems. The second result is more technical. It uh, entails um, uh, 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 a weaker interaction between the X and the gradient because before the inter there was no direct interaction between X and the gradient. And you have to, and you prove the same thing, but assuming that, inter that the interaction is, is, is milder because this is a more technical assumption. This is the growth of the second eigenvalue of G, which is convex. And uh, you assume that alpha plus gamma is less than p. And still, the, the asymptotic is the same. Observe that now also this quantity goes to zero as you approach it, equality here. Two minutes more. Thank you. And then we are in the real realm of uh, uh, Schauder theory. This is the problem I, I showed you before. You get a uniformly, a non-uniformly elliptic integrand. You put coefficients, so you are in the real realm of Schauder theory, and then you prove that u is elder continuous if coefficients are elder continuous. Moreover, if you assume that the, the functional is non-degenerate, and this is a necessary assumption, you get elder continuity with the same exponent. And this is the Exactly the analog of the results of both Kachopoli and Schauder for non-uniformly elliptic problems. This is done for functionals, and you can also have an intermediate theorem when there is dependence on B. But you have to assume that P is larger than N because the judge in Ashmoser theory cannot hold in this setting. This is a more technical point I will skip a bit. In the case of general equations, and this is the last result I'm going to talk about, uh, the concept of the energy solution is not clear. You have PQ equations. And for instance, uh, uh, if you, uh, an energy solution is, an, is a solution which is in W1, uh, W1P regular, 
But in order, and it is necessary to test uh, equations of this type with, uh, with such solutions. In the case of PQ equations, uh, energy solutions means this. Is it really necessary to get energy solutions to start by energy solutions? Uh, the answer is given by this recent paper by Colombo and Tione that they prove that if you have a, a, a distributional solution to the Pilaplacian equation, which is not an energy solution, then you don't get energy solutions. So you, get, you don't get further regularity. This, by the way, this proves a so-called safe conjecture by Ivan and Burdone, who conjectured that this was the case safely. It is not the case. Starting by this problem, we can then prove Schauder theory, either assuming that you have energy solutions that are in W1Q, or you get existence and regularity theorems in the style of Lagicheska and Durialtsev and Ivanov. So you select them by approximation methods. We can do both. I prefer telling the results on the second one. And the second one is the following one. Take an elliptic equation, which is non-uniformly elliptic in the classical sense with the continuous coefficients. And then we prove, we prove that there exists uh, uh, a solution with the locally elder continuous gradient provided the usual bounds are known. And in the case of non-degeneracy, which is an accessory assumption, then we prove that the Hilder continuity of the gradient exists, takes place. This is for these kinds of model examples. For more general functionals, we consider the uh, uh, so-called relaxed functionals and uh, uh, we prove that shadow estimates always take place for minimizers of relaxed functionals. And then when there is no Lagrangian phenomenon, which is a necessary condition that we prove that the shadow estimates take place for original minimizers. For this, I would recommend to see a very interesting recent paper by Christiana de Filippis. But, um, Essentially, the main result is contained in the is is of this type. Then we have uh, we have uh, uh, we have Schauder theory for non-uniformly elliptic problems, and this settles this long-standing uh, issue. So I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Question, comments, remarks. One more question possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is about of density of smooth functions in energy space for your variant of PQ Laplacian. Variant with degenerated degenerate coefficient. Uh, what do you mean exactly? What, what kind of uh, uh, spaces? Energy okay, space. what kind of um, okay if you do consider these functionals then the, uh, you you always have approximation in energy, so there is no problem with that. And you, you never have Lagrange phenomenon. For equations, you prove existence and regularity of solutions, so there is no problem in that respect. And for more general functions, you might face the, possi the possible occurrence of Lagrange phenomenon. Therefore, what you do is the following. You do consider the relaxed functional. The relaxed functional as always, regular minimizers according to our approach. And when, the, when there is no Lagrangian gap, so when there is approximation, then original minimizers are also minimizers of the relaxed functionals, and uh, there is no there is, there is no problem. Okay, more uh, 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 could you say? Uh, whether the constants one fifth and uh, one tenth and so on are sharp. Uh, here. No, 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 no. Yeah, so you can even, uh, for instance, if you take this, you can replace one fifth by a very complicated expression that I really did not want to report here because uh, it's not the case. I, I mean, uh, the important thing in these results, for instance, it, it's it's the asymptotic. This, you see that uh -huh. this constant, for instance, is bounded away from zero and infinity. So it's not a problem. And uh, the important thing is that this goes to zero. So Q 
tends to be uh, close to P when alpha goes to zero and N goes to plus infinity with the same sharp asymptotic of the double phase functional. So the asymptotic of the bounds is sharp. The bound itself is, uh, this is not, this can okay. even be improved. And actually even in the non-autonomous case, the best one is not known. But uh, on the, at this, in this respect, I wanted to consider the, the, the sharp asymptotic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so asymptotic on the quantity alpha over n, so that it decays uh, basically as uh, as you would expect. Yes, okay, sir. more questions. If it's not the case, let's thank the speaker again.